I remember in my undergrad, always when I was rowing, often having a little bit of trouble with training on my own on the rowing machine. And sort of it, it would be a little bit easier to sort of give up on a really long piece if there was no one else around versus if I had like another guy on the team and we went out for an extra training at the end of the day, a lot, you just feel more motivated, right? And this feels very intuitive, I think for most people, but the like the computations that our brain makes that it goes through to make those decisions, those are not well known. So I ended up studying how people make decisions about effort when the reward is for another person versus the reward being for yourself. Hi folks, I'm Dan Dworkis and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Dr. Nick Angelides. Nick is a cognitive neuroscientist at the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative at the Wharton School at UPenn. His work focuses on how we can leverage advances in biotechnology and applied neuroscience to better understand behavior, specifically anything from everyday actions to elite performance. Before working at Penn, he completed his PhD at UC Berkeley in the Neuroeconomics Lab, where he used functional neuroimaging and computational modeling to learn how the brain makes decisions about when to work hard for yourself versus for other people. As you'll hear a lot about on this podcast during the course of his PhD, he also spent four years coaching Cal's lightweight rowing team. Over the course of this conversation, we go back and forth between experiences as a coach and as an athlete, as well as Nick's scientific background and training and what he's currently studying. And along the way, we do a really deep dive into what the science says about how to study really rigorously the drivers of human performance and especially human performance under pressure. We talk about what it means to be better in terms of the high-performing individual and teams. We explore things like motivation. We dig into what we can and can't measure when it comes to human performance and what to do about that. And we drift a little bit into math, talking briefly about things like logistic regression models and Markov blankets. Now, before we get started, and don't worry, I promise there's not going to be too much math, I have a favor to ask which is that if you like what you hear on the Emergency Mind podcast, I would really appreciate your help getting the word out. So consider finding a friend or a colleague and directing them here to the podcast at emergencymind.com slash podcast, towards the book at emergencymind.com slash book, or just towards emergencymind.com and help us build a broader and richer, deeper community of individuals and teams who are committed to understanding and exploring human performance under pressure. From myself and everybody at the Emergency Mind Project, we would deeply appreciate it. Okay, all of that said, let's jump into this episode. I hope you enjoy. All right, Nick, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. I'm excited to have you. It was great meeting you the other day, which we'll get into in a second. And I'm I'm just, I'm really psyched for this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So uh, why don't we start for folks that don't know you? Do you want to give just like a quick overview of of who you are and and what your relationship to human performance is and, and what's going on? Sure. Yeah. So I am a cognitive neuroscientist. Uh, I work with the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative at the Wharton School at UPenn. And I'm working with a group that is sort of combining advances in, I guess, biotech and taking recent developments in psychology and, and neuroscience to basically try to figure out what it is that makes people good at what they do or are good at, anywhere from what people do every day me doing my job, you doing your job or whatever, to super high performing athletes who are doing crazy things that I could never dream of getting my body to do. So we're interested in sort of all of that and what that entails. So personality, biological measurements, right? The brain, heart, things like that, and psychological factors, cognitive factors as well, right? So our hope is basically to be able to figure out what those things are and and to try to use them for good, Right. I would say (laughs) that's a good start. Not not, not for not for evil. Right. I sort of got into this because I was a college athlete many moons ago and sort of a thing that you think about often when you're doing competitive sports, just your own performance, the performance of those around you, how they compare, how they sort of feed on each other or don't. And uh, I sort of got into science a little bit later in life, actually, after college and uh, started working in a lab and saw sort of opportunities to start investigating these questions. And then um, did my PhD at UC Berkeley, studying sort of motivated decision-making. So how we make decisions to, to sort of work hard in both individual contexts and like social contexts on teams and things like that. And sort of one thing led to another and now I'm doing this. 
I want to go back to the beginning in a second about how you started getting interested in your own human performance as an athlete, but you said something right at the beginning that really sparked my interest there. So do you think it's the same things that make us good at our day-to-day tasks as it is that make us good at the hardest things, or is it really a different deck of cards entirely? Um, that's a good question. That's not something I've thought about a lot. I think like being good at an everyday task, I don't know what it would entail to be good at an everyday task, but like, you know, m- making sure that you get up on time or something like that. Um, ultimately, yeah, I think it's a lot of it is habit based, which is something that I'm sure we'll end up talking about is, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of it is, you know, my coach in college always used to say practice doesn't make perfect fellows perfect practice makes perfect, right? You know, there's a, there's a lot behind that that's layered, but I think that there's something to that, right? Like every day you do the same thing over and over again, but you get to a point where it's hard to get out of doing that. And I think that any sort of high performance person or coach or whatever will tell you that it's really practice is at the end of the day, a thing that's going to get you where you want to be performance wise. I think it's a, a pretty common theme among a lot of what we do at the Emergency Mind Project that we break down these ultra high performance moments and these really like incredibly complicated emergency spaces. And we see that when you open them up a little bit, there's some really high performance moments in them and there's some sort of mundane moments in them and that everything is really a mix in there. And I actually hadn't thought, you know, we, I'd thought about it in terms of like, the Miyamoto Masashi quote, like to know the way broadly is to see it in all things, right? The idea that like when you really try to study and perfect yourself, like how you do a small thing is really, really similar to how you do a big thing. And the yeah. little steps that you take in your small moments equal these larger things. And it's not just the accumulation of marginal gains, although that's certainly part of it, but it's also right. the ethos or the the spirit with which you approach a lot of these tasks. So that makes yeah. sense to me, but I never actually thought about it the way that you, that are sort of like lining this up a little bit that like, is it the same set of things that makes me good at one or another? Like how much transferable are those skills? Right. I guess I'd ask like, when you all are studying this, right? In your current life, are you studying particular tactics that people use? Or are you trying to take it from, Hey, here's a bunch of high performers. Let's ask them what they do. Or are you taking it more in the other direction of like, here's a thing we think matters, right? We think habit-driven, low acuity to high acuity practice really matters. Let's practice that in a bunch of areas. Largely what we do is is to sort of look at different populations that do the same sorts of things, right? So take club, uh, sort of like high school soccer players versus you know professional mm. soccer players, right? We might do is to say, okay, we're going to give you a sort of battery of cognitive tasks neural or uh, other biophysiological measures and sort of personality self-report measures. And think about it in terms of like a, this sort of regression model, I sort of getting a little, little technical, maybe I, I'm no, sure. No, let's do it. Will, Absolutely. All right. So think about You're it. You're not scared of, like, of regression models. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Where you have like what you're trying to sort of predict is being high performing, right? And then you have a one or a zero where you're, you know, you're a high performing individual or you are not, but you're doing the same sort of thing with the entire population, the whole sample. And you take scores on all these different measures, right? And essentially what we're hoping to see is like, where are the patterns, right? That lead to predicting the one and not the zero, right? So I'm not going to lie. At the beginning of this, it was sort of this a little bit of a kitchen sink approach. We got, you know, a bunch of sort of experts who knew different areas that might be relevant to what we were looking at, um, whether it was sports, whether it was, you know, something military related. And we're like, okay, what sort of experimental psychology tasks, right, would be good to do here? What sort of predictive self-report personality things are good to do here? And then because we're neuroscientists, we, we threw in some neural measures, of course. You know, some of those things ended up being pretty highly predictive. And some of those things ended up being totally meaningless that we were surprised were meaningless. So it's, it's sort of, there wasn't one way that we went at it. We sort of just came together and started sketching things out and came up with a battery. And it's not always the same for every project that we're doing either. And it's still evolving. I'm only one one year into working with this group and we're still fine-tuning a lot of what we're doing. You guys haven't discovered all the secrets yet, huh? Okay. No, not yet. And if I knew them, I'd make you pay for them, you know? (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. No, I, okay. So there's a, there's a lot of different directions to go from there. And this is a really interesting deep dive into the science of this, which I think is really important because uh, something that we talk a lot about in the emergency department to bring it back to my world for a second is, okay, well, if we want to get better, 
how do we know? How do we know if we're better at something than we were, right? And some things are measurable and easy to define, right? I can look at somebody's blood pressure. If you give a certain drug and be like, does that blood pressure go up or down? Okay. I, I understand that. I understand how to measure that. I understand how to test that. A lot of what we work on in the field of human performance is a little bit harder to measure. And part of that is because we don't have closed loop systems all the time, right? It's difficult to draw lines between an input and an output. Like, okay, we're going to look at a bunch of people like me that resuscitate people, and we're going to give half of them an intervention on skills performance. Well, like, okay, does that, like, what is the linkage between one thing and the other? And the other is, how do you define who's high performing? So right. how, how do you do that? I mean, what, what types of metrics for like, yes, anytime you have a regression model, you need a one or a zero, or at least a fuzz around one or a zero to sort of classify right. people in one range or another. But how, yeah. how do you do that? How do you decide who's high performing and how do I yeah. get in that group? I, yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's a really good question. We're all, we're all trying to figure out how to get into that group. So the, the populations that we've been working with so far have sort of been predefined as high performing mm. by the people who've come to us asking, right? So we are currently working with a, a sports team whose name I will not say right now, but they basically came to us and uh, said, you know, we have starters and then people who don't start, right? And we want the people who don't start to be as good as the people who start, right? And that's as good as we're going to get in terms of who's performing highly and who's not. Right. In terms of, you know, working with, say, we're working with a military group, there are sort of these, this, these sort of hierarchies where the, you know, the people who test the highest and get through all of these trainings, they're the ones who are in this high performing group. And so there might be people who've gone through the testing that didn't make it. Right. And they get to try again later on. And so we're trying to say, okay, how can we spend a little bit less time? in training and the risk of attrition that you see in different military organizations to ensure that people get to this level. And we say, okay, well, that level is sort of the benchmark, right? And that's sort of how we define high, high performing, at least in, in what we've been doing so far. But I think you bring up a, a really good point, which is that, you know, what we would call like latent variables that come into play all the time. You know, we don't always get to know, in fact, we never get to know exactly what's happening with every single person in every single situation. So we have sort of this things that we test every day, right? So what is your mood today? And you ask them 60 questions about their mood. How was your sleep last night? You ask them 10 questions about their sleep last night and the, you know, the, the last week and the month and things like that. And you, you basically just try to get as much information as you can. It's like kind of just a, a data game. My PhD is in molecular medicine. And one of the things that we worked on was looking at the severity of different types of manifestations of sickle cell disease, right? So you'd have all these people that had this classify through this very interesting process, which I'm going to skip for a second, the really severe cases and the really mild cases. And then you'd go and you'd take basically a genome-wide association study to try to look for markers that predicted whether or not somebody would be severe or mild. And so this, this framework of dissecting a problem like that, like if you're able to understand what is essentially, we're talking about a phenotype here, right? Like a high-performing yeah, phenotype, exactly. and then look at the underlying genotype, which is what goes into that person that makes them like that. And then subdivide that into, okay, what's modifiable and what isn't? And then ultimately ask these questions about, all right, well, what do we do with this, right? What do we yeah. do with this knowledge? How translatable is it? How do we deliver that sort of theoretical construct all the way down at the point of the spear where people need it to be? Like this is a hard and sophisticated and really worthwhile scientific approach to trying to analyze some of these deep problems. It's a, it's a huge question, right? And it's, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is not something that any, I, I think is going to be immediately answerable without in general, right? You can't just say like, how do we make people better? First of all, th there's a lot of, that's a layered question in general. I don't want to say at all that what I do or I'm interested in is like just making like humans better, right? I am interested in how people do what they do and how people come to be very good at things. And the, the sort of different variables that, you know, that might interact with one another that, that sort of lead up to this case, right? It's a huge question. It's a complicated question, but, you know, one must start somewhere. And to your point, sort of a, a question of clustering and, and what, how do we do that? We just get as much data as we can. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly one of the ways that we answer questions like that. And I think you hit something really important, which is that one of the things we need to answer questions about how, because right, like that's what we're doing here, right? We're interested in how individuals and teams perform better in really high pressure situations. We're also interested in how they perform better in low pressure situations, but yes. we have this bias towards high pressure situations, right? So one of the things we need is we need to be able to define what better is. What do we right. think better is, or what do we think high performance is? 
And let's circle back to that for a second. Could I have some thoughts about how to do that in an emergency department or in sort of emergencies in general? But let's say we have that. Let's say we have what better looks like. What else do you need to put into this hopper to try to start to do some of this science? But let's break it down slightly. So let's say that you're somebody who's listening to this, who is sort of early midpoint in your training to do something hard, right? And we're going to use ER doctors as an example, because it's an easy one for me, right? So you're starting off, you've decided you're going to be an ER doctor. You're just started getting in your training and you're sitting around being like, how do I get better at things? How do I get better? And you have some structure already put in place, right? Because you see people that are three, four or five years, 10 years ahead of you. And you see them and you're like, oh, that person is better. Like that's a really good example of this thing I want to do. And then you look at yourself and you're like, this is a really bad example of what I want to do. (laughs) Right. And so you have a little bit of a framework around that. Like what else do you look at to try to answer these deeper questions about, about how to get better? Right. I mean, this is sort of a question of learning, right? And like, there are so many ideas about how people learn best. Obviously there's a very bottom up approach, which is you know, using the sort of these like uh, incremental steps of like little pieces of information and doing little things every single day. And then there's also um, an argument for a more top-down approach, right? Where you sort of try to force yourself to make these big steps very early on, right? Sort of do the, like the steep learning curve thing. I mean, surely there's, it's somewhere, it's somewhere there in the middle, right? Where you're, what we were saying earlier, little sort of incremental things that, that you do every day, but you also have to get to a point where you're willing to challenge yourself and, and actually push yourself up that steep hill. And yeah, I mean, I, it's funny that you made that example of the person who's, you know, 10 years ahead of you or whatever. I remember the first day that I walked down to the boathouse in my, in my undergrad, I was a rower and seeing a guy that was a senior on the team and I was a freshman and he was just like this big sort of like super strong dude, like on the erg, like going. And I was like, that's what I want to look like. And I look in the mirror, I'm like, that is not what I look like. What do I got to do? And of course, what I had to do was, you know, do this for four years and get to that point. But that's, yeah, I mean, you, you have to set those goals and understand the the sort of models, right. That uh, with the, the parameters within which you can work, but also like coaching, teaching, these are crucial things. You, you have to also be willing to look for that and go out of your way to, to get that. Oh man, so much stuff in there. Let's keep driving in that direction. So take me back. So, so you're just starting and you, did you row in high school? No, I, I walked on. Walked on. Okay. So, and had you ever rowed anything before or what, what made you walk into that boathouse that day? <laughs> um, well, I was at a party my freshman year and I, I ran and swam in high school. So I was somewhat athletic and someone came up to me and said, you're tall and, and you look like you play sports. We were thought about rowing. And I said, absolutely not, you know, please go away. And he wouldn't stop bothering <laughs> me until I, I agreed to, to take his number and come down to the boathouse. And I did, and I fell in love with it pretty much immediately. You'd been exposed to some level of like performance training before that yes. point. Yeah, yeah for right. sure. Yeah. What was it like starting out with, I imagine at like almost all collegiate level sports, like the collegiate level rowing was like, was high performers. Like these were high performing people and you yeah. were, you were joining the ranks of this high performing team. What did that look like as you are not just trying to master the physical skill of moving yourself in a boat through the water? but right. the, everything else that went along with that. Like, what was that transition like? Yeah, it was um, interesting. I think it's sort of a, a common theme among people who, you know, live sort of high-performing adjacent lives that people don't like to do things that they're not good at, right? It's like a, you know, for start things or whatever. And so I think if it hadn't been for the fact that rowing is a very interesting sport and in that it's it's participatory in a lot of ways. So most rowing teams will have some number of walk-ons who've never done it before. But so, so I was lucky that there were a few other guys that, that had never done it before and they, you know, anticipated that. And so we, we got sort of special attention and special training to sort of get us up to speed. But there were also plenty of guys on the team that had been doing it for years, were super, super talented. And they were always the ones who actually got to race. And they were always the ones who, you know, were getting a lot of attention from the head coaches. But, you know, I think being around people that were motivated to get to the point, to get to the, seeing the the senior guy being like, that's me being around other people who were similarly motivated and sort of kept me going. And I kept them going. That was crucial for me. And also a big part of my PhD research was, was sort of social motivation. Yeah. Tell me about that. Dig, dig into that. 
Well, so my the majority of my PhD research was in decision making, right? And I was interested in in the trade offs that we make about cost benefit trade offs, where the cost is energetic, it's effort, right? So literally working hard at something, and the benefit you can sort of think about what it could mean in the real world, but in the lab, it was money. And uh, I remember in my undergrad, always when I was rowing, often having a little bit of trouble with training on my own on the rowing machine. And sort of, it, it would be a little bit easier to sort of give up on a really long piece if there was no one else around versus if I had like another guy on the team and we went out for an extra training at the end of the day, a lot, you just feel more motivated, right? And this feels very intuitive, I think for most people, but the like the computations that our brain makes that it goes through to make those decisions, those are not well known. So I ended up studying how people make decisions about effort when the reward is for another person versus the reward being for yourself. And during my PhD, I was coaching crew as well, sort of as a side job. And so I was would take some of these ideas that I found from, honestly, from coaching and be like, oh, that's a really interesting sort of little behavior that I just saw, you know, where one guy, when he's working out with person A is doing a lot better, but when he's working out with person B, he doesn't do so well. You know, they're both his teammates. What is different about them? Right. Mm -hmm. So I ended up sort of using this social psychology framework that allows people to like look at different attributes of person perception and use that in my research to ask, like, you know, if you were working hard for a nurse versus working hard for a lawyer, who would you be more willing to work to get them a dollar or $2 or $5, mm -hmm. right? And then how explicit were you with your team about experimenting? I don't know. I was about to say on them, but maybe with them is a nicer yeah, way to, with, nicer way yeah, to put yeah. that. Are you like, guys, we're yeah. going to try this thing today that I just thought, it, like, I just read about this idea. Like, let's see how it goes. Or does that somehow sort of change the charge of it versus if you're like, this is what we're doing, this will definitely work. So the the team that I was coaching, it was a club rowing team, the lightweight rowing team at Cal. And there was always sort of this mix of super highly motivated, have a little bit of trouble saying like, you know, internally motivated, because I think that's sort of a, a weird thing that, that we can get into. But people who would sort of come in and have no trouble just working really hard immediately, taking on leadership roles, and then people that would come in with, you know, very little athletic backgrounds and had a little bit more trouble sort of pushing themselves through through workouts and things. And you sort of start to get a sense of who's who pretty early on. So, you know, I would see in the mornings at practice, if we were doing an indoor training, take down their numbers at the at the end of every urge session, right? You look at the rowing machine, it's got how long it took to do what distance. And I take those down. And so after a while, I was always, you know, I'm a scientist, so I would sort of enter them into to my models and start to see what day is sitting next to what person caused them to do better. Typically, it was, of course, the people that were a little bit faster than them, but not too much faster than them. That would make someone work a little bit harder, right? And uh, that sort of just came together after the first few months or so. And that wasn't even when I had started my like dissertation work. This was like very early in my PhD when I was like, what am I going to do? And then I saw this and I was like, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and that's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. And what like, again, like we're hitting again, the importance of being able to measure the output of something and use that measurable thing to sort of tune you towards where you're trying to go with it. This is like seat of your pants, expository thinking here, but how do you think you would have approached that differently if you were doing a task where the output is a lot less clear? So the output being just sort of like trying to get, getting these guys faster and like, you know. Yeah. That's like that's sort of like a middle range, right? Like fully defined and fully quantifiable is how long it takes you to row from point A to point B, right? Sure. Totally yeah. undefined is, I don't know, an, an improved spirit of self. Or right. like something that I'm not even sure yeah. what to put on that end. And then somewhere in the middle are goals that are like faster, right. sort of right. not otherwise specified. Yeah. How do you think that would have changed the way that you approached that? That's a good question. I don't know that it would have necessarily. Hmm. I think that like as a coach of crucially like club athletes, like a lot of them were super talented athletes and, and they did really well, but these are people who are here to be students first and not, and they're not there to row. Although if you ask some of the guys on my team, they will disagree with you about that. But, you know, 
ultimately as their coach, like I was there to teach them the sport, but I also know from my own experience, the joy that being on a team brings, right? So for me, I, at the very beginning of every year, my main focus is to get them to want to stay around, right? And to, and to be happy, right? It's not, I don't go in there being like, we're just going to like do fun and games and have pizza parties and stuff like that. That's not what I mean by that. But I, you know, I want people who are motivated. So I try to make sure that there's a little bit of a filter, right? For people who want to work hard and people who don't. But beyond that, like you see very early on people who want to work hard, but maybe don't have the athletic background, right? Mm. Um, So you just try to make sure that they're feeling better for that very low level, like fuzzy defining thing, right? Which is like just making them want to be there, showing up every day, the sort of initial benchmarks. And then once you start to get them a little bit more fit, then you can start doing those sort of like little seat racing things next to each other. And that it, they're sort of dependent on each other is the the short way of answering that. I think that um, at least in, in this instance, they couldn't really have happened without the other. So I'm hearing you say that what it means to be better has to do sort of with where you're starting, right? And like what's achievable for you. And then also it's a thing that is a, a moving target based on where you are. Right. So better for person A isn't necessarily going to be better for person B. But in both cases, what's important is having a sense of the direction of what better is, because then you can apply all of these ideas about whether it's, you know, learning or behavioral economics or neuroscience or whatever to be like, okay, once we know where better is, here's how we're going to get to better. Is that about right? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And also, like, you know, making it clear, giving them some responsibility over the the feeling of being on a team and ensuring that they understand that when one person is doing better, then that means that they're also doing better, right? And this sort of creates this like team momentum to make makes everyone want to do a little bit better. What did that feel like for you when you were just starting to learn as an athlete yourself? Right. Like when you were on the team, was this explicit? Was it like, all right, guys, we're going to work on this technique. And then also today we're going to work on this sense of bonding and purpose, or was it just sort of implicit? Like, Hey, we do this all the time. Yeah, it was pretty implicit. My freshman coach had a particular talent for, you know, making people who wanted to like be there and get good at a thing that they had no experience with excited about being there. And I, you know, I'm not gonna lie when I first started, like my first couple of years of rowing, I wasn't particularly good. I wasn't particularly strong. I was pretty skinny. I was on a heavyweight team. Like I was, but I stuck around because, you know, for the reasons that I've, that I've enumerated, I think like this sort of necessary thing that happens that when a coach is able to make you motivated just by like having you there, just by like putting you in a boat, right. Even if you're not good or whatever, then it, you have you have to sort of rise to the occasion. So when I first started, there were days that would be like, "Sorry, like you didn't, you know, you didn't make the time yesterday, whatever." You, you know, erg. Well, we're out. When we come back, we'll take down your times and and we'll go from there. And you know, that is that was motivating. And having other guys next to me that also didn't make it was motivating. Having this, like, the guy that was like a little bit faster than me in the boat and I wasn't that was motivating. But there was never like a not immediately, at least there wasn't a, you guys all have to love each other or whatever. It was just sort of like, you're all in this together. You're all waking up really early or staying up really late to do this thing that like, why would you do this unless you really wanted to Um, (laughs) sort of just implicitly created a, a sort of environment of camaraderie. Yeah. I think that's so important. And the reason I'm sort of steering us in into some of these questions and inter- interleaving a little bit is that like if you go back to that model of like what makes somebody better, what makes a better person different than somebody who's not, like there's certainly personal factors. There's stuff on the inside of you. And we can talk about intrinsic motivation in a second, but there's mm-hmm. there's things that you do, there's decisions that you make about the day before, there's how you feel and how you've trained. Then there's these team factors, right? And there's like how you're brought together in a unit and who guides you through this purpose to sort of create that spark and that extra, I don't know, mixing my metaphors here, but that extra spice that sort of makes Mm -hmm. it all the difference in there. I wonder when you guys are studying human performance, how do you disentangle those things? There are certain things that we have to sort of like hold even. We can't go in there and know everything about how for example, a sports team, every individual guy was coached coming up. Right. So there, you know, there are only so many variables that you, that you have control over. And 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think like you have to sort of just make certain assumptions as any scientist does when they're doing an experiment. And, uh, mm. you know, if, if there are things that, that come up that, that you have to sort of try to manipulate, then, then you do as you go. But there's certain things that you don't get to have control over. And, and that's part of applied science. This is a good, we're going to deep dive slightly farther into this because I think it's like, we're sort of talking about Markov blankets here, right? Where we're saying, okay, we can't see everything. You certainly can't see everything in the past for how somebody's trained or what they've done like a year ago or even a week ago, but you can sort of see what they're doing right now. And if you can see what they're doing right now, you can make, you know, and like a little bit of for that, maybe you can make some assumptions about what happened and try to figure out what the set of variables is that controls for some of this. And there's, you know, there, there's also ways for us to sort of try to get a little bit of that. Like, of course, you have demographic variables, right? And and those exist for a reason, right? Like, the, there's always individual factors, but you know, we also can work within, you know, the statistics. We we understand that certain groups do certain things certain ways, right? Like people who came up uh, in a specific, like socioeconomic status or a certain educational background are going to act a certain way on average, right? Or are going to do certain things on average. And so those are some of the, you know, assumptions that it's people, you have to hold even. Yeah. So we, we do get as much of that as we can. But again, you know, there's latent things that come up every day that you don't have any control over. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about how many times my own actions under stress and pressure were influenced by things that seem to be relatively far away from what I was doing. Right. Oh, yeah. How many times like my response to a crashing patient was ticked off by something that my karate instructor had said when I was a kid about how to like think through a problem and yeah. you know the different paths that we take to get there. Because I think inherent to and underlying our conversation is a shared belief that there are modifiable factors for how to get better. Mm-hmm. There are better sure. and worse ways to get better. Yeah. But but people get better, but and but most people get better sort of over time. But not everybody gets better at the same rate. Not everybody gets better to the yeah. same destination. And yeah. it's not always obvious like why or how that happens, right? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, like there's learning styles. I'm not I'm not a learning expert, so I, I won't get too deep into that. But like, you know, there's different learning styles. People do things differently at different stages of their life developmentally. To your point, there are things happening in people's lives that might get in the way. I remember one time when I was a junior in college, I had a, in a, a big erg test. We do these 2000 meter erg tests and like, that's your fitness test. Show up fit you are. Um, they're horrible. horrible. It's like, it, it is, it's torturous, but it's the thing. A 2k test is a thing. Um, and I had a 2k test and I got into a huge fight with my now ex. And the next day I just was like, went into it. Like I'm so pumped up. I'm so motivated. I'm so mad. And then after like 500 meters, I was like, actually, I'm just really sad. And all my motivation just went away. And I probably did one of the worst tests I've ever done. I had to go to my coach afterwards and beg for forgiveness. But anything can affect how you improve or don't improve. I think we've all been there (laughs) one way or another. Well, let's, let's shift gears slightly about that then. And I guess let's ask this. So what do you think? And And I recognize that this isn't a totally answerable question. But what do you think are parts of the ingredients of the secret sauce, right? If I gave you a team right now, and let's call it a crew team to make it the decision a little bit easier, and you could do anything you wanted, you could set it up exactly how you wanted. Here's a pile of money and time and everything that you wanted. What do you think some of the secret sauce is at getting really good at what you're trying to do? Don't hire me as a coach. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think, uh, yeah, there's... The first and most obvious thing to me is it's never just going to be the guys that like have the best statistics on the ERG, right? It's like for any sort of like high performing team, it can't just be very rarely going to be like, you know, the top people who like are just the best at this one thing, right? And like, this was a, an important point that our coach used to bring up, like ERGs don't float, right? You, you get on an ERG and, and you can show your fit, but once you're on the water, you have to have good boat feel, good boat chemistry. You have to have like a good sort of trusting relationship. And I think the first thing is make it less about just the sort of one testing factor, right? Whatever it might be for this team. And another thing is making sure that the group that's on the team trust one another. That's like an absolutely crucial component. Like I said, I ran and swam in high school. And so I'd always sort of been an individual sport athlete. And then being on the crew team, like made me sort of weirdly a mix, but you're in an eight. So you're on a team of like 
you and eight other guys or seven other growers and a coxswain. And so you're, you all have to rely on each other. You're as fast as the, the slowest guy in the boat, right? You have to trust that the guy in front of you and the guy behind you are going to pull as hard as you're going to pull for them. And yeah, creating this sort of environment of trust and ensuring that there's no, a single person on the team that like thinks they're the best or has, you know, the big ego or whatever, which again is sort of intuitive thing. And like ensuring that the, the, everyone knows that they're sort of all on equal footing, right? That they're, you know, people have all put in the time, people have all put in whatever output they have to put in to get to this, this space that they want to be in, whether it's, you know, winning a single race or just, you know, being this like team that wins all the time. If there's someone that's slacking off, if they're really good, they don't show up to practice because they're really good. They don't need to, right? And nobody's going to trust the guy on this team, right? So nobody's going to want to work as hard. That's a really important thing, I think, that I've seen from coaching. Rowan. It's interesting. A lot of what you just described is not really measurable in a lot of ways, right? Like you're saying, yeah. you're saying we can measure the erg, we can measure your mm-hmm. output, and that's what I'd feed into a logistic regression model or whatever, sure. classification regression system or whatever we're using. But what's also important is the stuff that I can't measure, how the person mm-hmm. rides the boat and feels in the water, how yeah. I understand trust and relationship between members of a team, and how do I build that? I think I, I, I might push back a little bit on saying that that's not measurable because I think that like, you know, you, you can experiment with your boat lineups, right. And you, you can, ah, you can okay. do a few days with one lineup and a few days with another and start to see which one moves better. Right. And it's not, you know, you might not get like exact numbers, but you're going to see which one is moving better. And you, you can also get feedback from the athletes. Like, yo, who do you want in the boat? And that's also a, a really good thing is to, show that the coach has some trust in the players for them to like understand themselves and their team. You can back your way into experimentally covering some of the possible space by yeah. thinking about how, like what parts of it you can approach like that. Hmm. How else do you build trust around a unit like that? In addition to the things that I've mentioned, right? Like ensuring that people show up and, and people put the time in and, and effort in having activities I don't want to say like trust building activities, but just like doing things that aren't just your sport together Mm -hmm. is like the the sort of first and most basic thing that I did as a coach to try to get people to know each other. Cause you can't really, it's pretty hard to trust someone if you don't have like a sense of them. Having people play a really fun thing that we used to do in college when I was rowing was playing Frisbee after like a hard Saturday workout. My coach would be like, all right, grab the Frisbee. You guys are going to go play for an hour and then go to lunch or whatever. And he wouldn't even come out to the field. We would just all go out and do this thing that had nothing to do. We're all also like tall, lanky people, like no hand-eye coordination at all. So I'm sure it looked (laughs) foolish, but it was some of the most fun we had. And that's when you start to like laugh together and become close. That's, I think that's important for a team at any level. That is awesome advice. That is. Nick, I've steered this conversation in a lot of ways towards the questions that I find really interesting from an emergency performance perspective, right? Things like how do you define what good is and how do you measure what things go into the secret sauce? But what questions do you find the most interesting about this? Like from your perspective as a scientist and as a performer yourself, like what do you wake up thinking about? What are you most fascinated by? mentioned earlier the thing about intrinsic motivation that's like a little bit sticky for me because for so long I always thought that like motivated people are motivated people right and unmotivated people are unmotivated people and that's that but after having done years of research on motivation I am really starting to doubt that and I think you can wake up feeling really good you got great sleep and you're like raring to go you have tons of energy and that feels like motivation, right? You feel, or you feel motivated, right? Um, and then there are like external motivators that might be like, you know, trying to train for a marathon or trying to hit, you know, your 225 on bench press or whatever the thing is. And that in itself is a motivator. So whether it's a question of like the, the semantics of the word motivation, maybe it's that, I don't know. But like one thing, and I was thinking about this a bunch because, you know, you asked me to think of a challenge for the listeners. And I would caution or uh, one thing that I think about is like, how do we get motivation, right? Is it always an internal force? Is it more likely an external force that sort of gets, that interacts with, you know, having good sleep and a high HRV and a, you know, 
you have, you're doing good breath work and whatever. And all of these things come together to be like, I've got energy today. I'm going to go do the things. Right. But I think really it comes down to if you have motivation for a specific thing, that thing is the thing that you care about. And some days you're not going to be motivated and that's that. And that's okay. And it's important also, I think to realize that and to like, look at that and sit with that and like, not shame yourself about it. Cause this is again, a thing that I dealt with a lot as an athlete. Some days it just doesn't come together. That's all to sort of say one thing that I'm really trying to figure out is how can we measure motivation? How can we operationalize motivation? If it's not always external, if it's not always internal, how do we get to a point where we can say, okay, we're kind of getting both of these things. We know what motivates certain people. We know what people are just have a little bit more energy all the time. And how can we get people to be around them to work a little bit harder? That's a big question for me. Looming idea of motivation. I've been studying it for a really long time and I still don't have a, I don't love the definitions that most scientists use. I hope, uh, hope they're not listening to this, but (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, that's so cool. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. What do you want them to take away? What do you want them to do differently and and try differently tomorrow? A lot of people talk about burnout and how that sort of is in some ways a like state of demotivation, right? And maybe that's part of it. And for me, I have to sort of like take stock of where I am in every day when I'm like, I get to the lab and, you know, I sit there for 30 minutes, just staring at my screen, drinking my coffee. And I'm like, am I going to get a lot of stuff done today? Am I not? At the end of my PhD, I was killing myself to write my dissertation. I, I know, you know, exactly what that feels like. It's not fun. And on the days when you're like super demotivated, you just kick yourself for it, right? You just get so mad at yourself. Like, what is wrong with me? And you know, what I would say is like, it's not a you thing, right? I think we should be able to understand and recognize that internal motivation isn't this like endless supply, right? We, we get it from different things. Take a step back, think about what matters to you and what is the thing that gave you motivation yesterday that you don't have today. And just sort of look at that, right? And think about it. And it might not mean that it comes back. It might not change much for you in the moment, but I think at least being able to sort of like take it and look at it and understand it is one step. And also, what are the systems that are making us burn out, right? Like we all, and it's very easy to say like at the individual level that we can't do much about these like, you know, systemic burnout, right? But yeah, we can't do much if nobody does anything. But if each of us individually starts to think about it, then I think that's a step. And this is like another thing that I think about that I didn't want to get too deep into is like the sort of like political side of a lot of this. It's like, why are we all burning out? There's got to be a reason for that, right? So it's not always your fault if you don't feel good when you wake up. <laughs> I wish I could go back in time and tell my earlier self who was sitting there in that lab beating his head against the wall trying to finish his PhD that exact yeah. sentence because that yeah. woof. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, especially oh, right now in this in this environment, yeah. it's tough. Yeah, and that quest that we have to be better is not a uniform linear progression right? You go forward, yeah. you go oh, back, absolutely. you turn sideways. That's all part of it. And yeah. you know, whether I'm reminding myself of that yesterday after jiu-jitsu class when I got my butt kicked or I'm right, you know, reminding, right. reminding my team of that in the middle of a resuscitation, like, yeah. you want your rowers to show back up the next day still excited to be there. I think that yeah. matters a ton. Yeah, absolutely. And mm-hmm. allowing people the space to understand why they might not feel great sometimes, right? And And supporting them through that. It's important. People are social beings, you know? Yeah. Love it. Nick, thank you so much, man. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Totally, totally a joy to get to talk with you about this. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate it. It was a really fun conversation. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed. As always on this podcast, our goal is to dive deep into what it takes to perform under pressure. Nothing that we discuss here should be construed as medical advice, and all of the opinions that we discuss are our own and are not necessarily representative of any organization with which we were affiliated or for whom we work. If you want to go even deeper and get more involved, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure, and you can find it at emergencymind.com book. All right, good luck out there.